Good afternoon. Uh, very excited to be here. This is Con 210, Getting to Large Amazon EKS Clusters. Uh, my name is Alex Kessner. I'm a senior product manager at Amazon EKS. I'm joined by Sham Jitagunta, a senior software development engineer uh, also at Amazon EKS. Uh, Sham also co-chairs the Kubernetes SIG Scalability Group uh, and is a top Kubernetes contributor. So uh, I want to kind of give a quick sense of what this talk is going to consist of. Uh, for those who for aren't familiar, maybe I'm going to describe a little bit of what Amazon EKS is, uh, and then Sham will, will dive straight into the, the scaling considerations you need to take into account uh, when working with very large Kubernetes clusters, uh, talking about scaling the EKS control plane, some of the work that we've done uh, internally, uh, as well as the Kubernetes networking uh, scaling considerations. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, an area that I, I focus on quite a bit, which is the Kubernetes cluster worker nodes some of the features that we've launched on Amazon EKS to, uh, to enable larger, larger clusters than, than currently were, were uh, possible before. And finally, how to, how to scale those nodes so they can grow and shift with your, your workloads as, as demand changes. Um, I, I wanted to start with a quote, though. I mean, sorry, a statistic. I think this is a really spectacular statistic. Uh, speaks to the, the, the kind of core position that Kubernetes plays uh, in, in AWS customers' uh, minds and, and sort of uh, the organizations that choose to use AWS as the place to run their Kubernetes workloads. 65% of organizations surveyed by the, uh, the CNCF uh, choose AWS as their, the home for their Kubernetes workloads. I think that's just an incredible, uh, incredible statistic to start with and, and one that, you know, a, a group that we really want to continue to, to serve as well as we can. So with that in mind, I, I'm going to give a quick, quick kind of overview of the kind of problems that, that um, Amazon EKS is meant to solve. You know, while, while these customers, all these 65% of organizations running Kubernetes on AWS uh, get great value out of it, deploying it at scale can be really challenging. Um, managing containerized applications and manager, managing Kubernetes at production scale can be really hard. It requires a significant amount of time to manage the upgrades, monitoring and scaling the control plane, and deploying and managing the lifecycle of operational software on Kubernetes, among you know, many other things. Uh, all this effort is, is time that can be spent uh, on moving the customer's businesses forward, as opposed to uh, you know, monitoring and, and operating their Kubernetes clusters. Our customers have told us that they'd really like to be able to focus more on their applications and the ideas that would allow them to deliver new products to market and to their end users. And so this is why we built Amazon EKS. Uh, Amazon EKS has kind of four central, I think, properties that we, that we like to highlight about the service. So first and foremost, Amazon EKS is vanilla Kubernetes. It is fully upstream and certified conformant Kubernetes. Applications that run on open source Kubernetes can be run on EKS. Uh, at the same time, we support four versions of Kubernetes uh, at any given time, giving customers plenty of time to roll out upgrades uh, as they need to move from one Kubernetes version to another, which can be challenging. Uh, and we also backport security patches beyond the, the, the versions that are supported by the community, uh, as well as making it easy to, to patch, patch fixes and make upgrades. You know, and, and this is all in service of a, of a managed Kubernetes experience uh, on Amazon EKS. We want to provide the security, stability, and operational excellence that our customers come to expect from an AWS managed service. And that's, that's one of our, our, our main tenets for, for EKS. We want to make EKS as simple as possible, uh, making to make Kubernetes operations boring and not keep everyone up at night. That's our job. So I'm going to hand it over to Sham, who's going to talk a little bit about what, what the elastic in elastic Kubernetes service means, because uh, he's been doing quite a bit of work on this over the last year or so. So here's Sham. Thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, like Alex said, um, I want to talk about what the elastic in front of Kubernetes means, because this is a question I've received from a lot of folks um, in the past. Um, so over the course of several customer meetings uh, I've been part of, there are a few common themes that come up um, with respect to like how customers want, uh, what do they think Elastic means and what do they want Elastic to mean, right? Um, some common themes here are with being able to run your workloads uh, across different environments, having the portability to do so, and at the same time also being able to extend uh, Amazon EKS to run various kinds of uh, use cases. So here's a sneak peek into 
all the different ways in which customers can run uh, their deployments on Kubernetes. There are more ways than ever before to run your Kubernetes deployments on Amazon EKS, ranging all the way across the spectrum from fully managed uh, Kubernetes experience to one where you self-manage it uh, to, to a great extent if you're someone who likes to have a lot of knobs in their control, right? At the same time, it's also a spectrum across where you want to run uh, your workloads, starting from running fully within the AWS infrastructure to running uh, on your on-prem um, infrastructure. So, for instance, with AWS Outposts, you can you can run your workloads uh, on AWS vended hardware uh, and software stack, but racks that can live uh, within your data center or close to your end users. And if you didn't wa want to manage this infrastructure yourself, you can use AWS uh, local zones uh, to deploy your applications to zones that are strategically placed by AWS close to your end users. This is especially important for uh, customers who are looking for low latency or real-time um, applications. So as you can see, our, our customers today use Amazon EKS in many ways across, uh, uh, across retail, finance, uh, mobile applications, web applications, data processing, gaming, and a plethora of these. So with that being said, while portability and extensibility are some common themes, one, uh, in, in, like more often than not, most customer discussions around Elastic end up uh, talking about scalability and performance, right? Our customers expect us to provide them uh, a platform where they can scale their workload seamlessly while continuing to also be matching their uh, performance uh, requirements. Right? So uh, before I dive deep into some of the amazing strides that Amazon EKS has done on various fronts in scalability, I want to uh, quickly uh, brief about some of the Kubernetes scaling considerations that you should keep in mind as customers. Um, so this is a slide I've uh, copied from my presentation in KubeCon Seattle in 2018, where I pitched this notion of a scalability envelope. Um, this is something we dearly um, use both within the Kubernetes community and within, within EKS to contextualize scalability. So, so that diagram, which is my mediocre job at trying to explain uh, the complexity of scalability, essentially um, is a hypercube. Um, I call it the scalability envelope, but uh, it's, it's a hypercube with multiple dimensions, right? Uh, most of you would be aware that with Kubernetes, there is a large number of uh, features, functionalities, and workflows that intricately interact with each other. So uh, you should really be thinking of scalability as a multidimensional problem. Um, rather than purely just in terms of the size of your uh, worker nodes or the size of your pods and, and stuff like that. So the diagram essentially what it says is um, it, it, it makes you think of scalability as um, an envelope as, which, is, which describes a subspace of configurations within which if you're operating, your cluster is in good shape and you're also meeting uh, some of the performance uh, SLOs that we said for ourselves. SLOs stands for service level objectives, which are precise ways to define um, and measure the performance of your cluster, right? Um, so since we launched, EKS is generally available more than three years ago. We have been constantly listening to our customers on what are the different dimensions that they want to improve upon. Um, so any managed Kubernetes provider has, has to inevitably think about, within the hypercube, what are the aspects, what are the dimensions that are most important uh, to optimize on, that are most relevant for customers, right? And this is a list of top talkers that I've come up with based on my experience um, on calling uh, for, for a few years with Amazon EKS, right? Customers often talk about uh, things like API latencies, API throughput, performance of their worker nodes, how quickly you can launch pods, how quickly you can tear them down, um, things around networking, like how, how, what's the rate at which you can make DNS queries and what's, what are some of the latencies, how do you scale your add-ons and your worker nodes. Um, so, you know, uh, Sham, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a bit of music playing in the room, which is, is very cool. 
but also a little tough to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, does that come with the talk? <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe we can, we can turn the music off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry, um, Sean. Cool. So, um, <laughs> okay. So that's about a lot of scalability. <laughs> That's about a, a different kinds of scalability issues that we we have seen our customers asking us about in the past. Um, right. So, all right. So, I want to systematically break this problem down into um, three pieces. Right. Like any scalable cluster essentially needs to have three pieces that scale. The first one is infrastructure, where you want your compute, networking, and storage uh, to scale because it's the foundation of your cluster and everything builds on top of that. And the second part is the Kubernetes and EKS built-in components that we manage, uh, we own, and we basically need to ensure that they scale um, for our customers. And the third part, which, um, which kind of falls more on the customer side, is uh, essentially your workloads. This includes your applications, any add-ons you might have installed, and it's, it's important that this scales as well along with the other two. Um, so with each of those sections, um, I'm, going to talk, uh, I'm going to dive deep into improvements that we made across the cluster, right, in the Kubernetes control plane, in the EKS cluster control plane, uh, in the networking side, and Alex is going to talk more about the worker nodes. Um, all right. So scaling the control plane, um, I'm not going to go too much into the details here. Uh, but um, Alex has already spoken about how we manage the control plane fully because this is undifferentiated heavy lifting for customers and we don't want them to be spending their time here. Um, so the picture here at a high level with some details ripped off, it essentially conveys the architecture of the control plane. Um, all this infrastructure runs securely and safely within the AWS uh, within the AWS infrastructure completely and we, each, each cluster's control plane gets a dedicated uh, VPC that's exclusive to that cluster, um, within which we launch your API server, which is the core part of the Kubernetes cluster that serves the Kubernetes API. We launch instances for that across different AZs, as well as the backend, uh, what we call as HCD, which is the backend uh, database storage for your um, for your for your cluster um, across these different AZs. So um, there are a bunch of load balances you see as well. Uh, they they run in public subnets while these instances are kept in private subnets for, for security and isolation purposes. Um, so your, your traffic essentially comes to the API through the NLB, um, and then the API server internally talks to the HCD instances through the classic load balancer nodes. Okay, so with this architecture, we are able to ensure high availability um, of your clusters in in few different ways. Right? Firstly, you would have noticed that we spread your instances across different AZs because we want your clusters to be um, to be uh, robust against single um, AZ events, right? And to ensure high availability and durability of your data um, as well, we we don't want to place all the eggs in the same basket, essentially. Um, so what comes with this control plane? EKS promises a 99.95% uptime SLA for your API server um, endpoint. And needless to say, this comes with year-round support, 24-7, round the clock. All right. So one important aspect that goes into um, ensuring high availability for your clusters is control plane right sizing. So I'm, I'm now talking about the infrastructure uh, piece in the, in the diagram I showed you earlier. So we need to scale your, uh, your instances uh, that run the API server and etcd proportionately with your load, right? We, 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 we move these instances depending on, on how much workload you have, your, have in your clusters all the way up and down if you're not using it, um, using it that much. So one of so some important aspects uh, that we uh, consider here uh, are the signals which may uh, which which propel us to auto to right size your clusters um, such as CPU memory and cluster size are something we've learned uh, as patterns and from experience operating hundreds and thousands of clusters and we are continually evolving the signals on which um, we, we scale this. this. This piece is really important um, 
to get it right, because especially if you have bursty workloads or uh, uh, workloads that come in interim spikes, uh, we want to be able to react quickly um, to those. OK, so um, yeah, essentially, the next part I'm talking about, uh, I'm changing the focus to a different component, which is the classic load balancer running in between the APS server um, and etcd instances, right? So one of the things um, we have observed with our customers in the past is while the classic load balancer does a great job uh, distributing the traffic between your API, traffic from the APS server instances to your etcd instances somewhat uniformly, um, it does come back with certain limitations um, as well, which is it adds an extra hop to your network because any traffic that comes um, to, to, to the etcd instances first reads the load balancer, which does some, uh, some L7 HTTP load balancing, um, as well as your CLB also needs to scale in proportion uh, with the traffic that flows between your APS server and etcd, and that's, that's, a, that's a hard problem to uh, get, get it right. So what, what did we do here? Um, we essentially got rid of the CLB altogether in the critical path between your API server and etcd instances, and we made the API server instances talk directly to the etcd instances from network interface to network interface. You, so you essentially get raw ENI to ENI performance, um, um, along with certain other benefits that I'll, I'll talk about. So before that, you're probably wondering, why am I talking about all this load balancer jazz in between API server and etcd, which is probably a transparent implementation detail for you. The reason is this actually has a tangible impact on your API um, experience, both with respect to performance and uh, with respect to um, availability. So, so, so the good thing about this new model is uh, going a little bit into the weeds. API server creates a bunch of etcd clients. It creates one etcd client for each API. Like for pods, it creates one etcd client for nodes, for secrets, for config maps, and so on. Um, and this client under the hood creates a connection to one of the etcd instances. So with this new model, what we are doing is we are actually at the client level itself, we are replicating the connections. So there is, for each client, there's one connection to each etcd instance. So essentially, we are redefining uh, the availability story to go a bit further. Instead of being available at the, um, instead of being highly available at the instance level, you are now highly available at each API level. Um, so that's that's a good thing to have. Um, all right. So let's next talk a little bit about volumes. What what do we have here? So what you see in this diagram is the volumes that are attached to etcd instances. This is probably the volume that is most critical to your EKS cluster because it's at the heart of, of all your API interactions. All your, uh, all your mutations to the cluster, all the APIs essentially end up at etcd and they, they hit the volume, right? So using innovations with Amazon Elastic Block Storage, or EBS as some of you may, uh, may call it, we are able to increase your volume throughput six times and I'm talking about the I.O. throughput with respect to reads and writes. So what does this mean for you? This means you can now get much higher write throughput for your API calls, but this is all while continuing to still have your single digit millisecond latencies, and um, also, uh, also your read API calls still continue to be served from memory, which, which is also typically lightning fast. Um, and of course, needless to say, we, we, we take automated etcd snapshots from time to time to protect your data in case we have to recover ever. Um, all right, so those are the things on the infrastructure side. Um, let me now switch to the, the second block in that, in that uh, circle that I, uh, that I was talking about, which is uh, the Kubernetes and EKS um, components, right? This, this is, the, the, after scaling your infrastructure, um, the story doesn't end. We need to make you uh, have access to much higher throughput, much higher workloads, much higher pod churn, and those kind of things within your cluster. So, so this needs a bunch of changes across your, um, across your cluster, because as, as most of you know, launching a pod is not the job of one single component. There are a lot of controllers and agents that are involved in the way. Um, so the first thing, and the most central piece is the API server, right? It's, it's the place which receives all your API calls, either from users, 
from controllers, from service accounts, and a lot of places. And you want this API server to be able to take a lot of traffic along with, uh, as you scale your clusters, as your clusters become larger, right? Um, so what we are working on right now, and this is gonna come soon, is auto-tuning to automatically adjust the rate, the throughput at which your API server can accept uh, API calls. Um, and this is all while continuing to get your um, performance uh, SLOs, right, with respect to the Kubernetes, uh, with respect to the, your API calls. Um, so, all right, so that's the first piece. But your story doesn't end here, right, like I was saying earlier. Once the APS is able to take a lot of requests, the next thing is you also want your Kube controller manager, which is the hub for all your workloads. It's responsible for launching pods, terminating pods, with your deployments and jobs, that needs to also keep up. So we are also working on auto-tuning the, the, the rate at which it can uh, create pods and delete pods and talk to the API server in, in proportionately with your cluster workload. And the third piece is scheduling, which is once you create your pods, um, you, you want those pods to be scheduled pretty fast as well. You don't want to be waiting on created pods that are not yet scheduled. So, which is why it's, it's important to tune the cube scheduler as well, and this is something that's, that, that we're also um, gonna do with your clusters. All right, so those are pretty much the primary components in the control plane. Uh, these are the cube, this is the core Kubernetes components that most of you would be aware about. Um, there's a lot of background work that has also gone into EKS controllers and EKS uh, managed webhooks and controllers and stuff like that that we run um, on your control plane to implement various features. So uh, we needed to make those scale as well with your workload. Um, all right, so after all this, the final piece is once your pod is scheduled, your, the kubelet on your worker node where the pod is scheduled picks up the pod and runs it and notifies it back to the API server. That is, uh, that is when you can finally consider your pod to have actually started. So your kubelets also need to be able to start pods at a, at a, fast, at a fast rate. By default, um, in, in Kubernetes, the kubelet gets a QPS of five uh, while making API calls to the uh, API server. This, this, this is pretty decent if you have a large cluster because each node gets five QPS so you can launch a large number of pods. But if you wanted to configure this, that is also possible on Amazon EKS today using what uh, we call as uh, custom launch templates for your worker node. Alex is gonna talk more about that uh, in his part. Um, so, okay, that's about um, as much as I had for, the, for uh, tweaking the Kubernetes and EKS components. The next one is, uh, this, is the, this is the third trident. I don't know what I'd call that, but uh, the, this is the last piece, which is customer workloads. Um, this is mostly in your control, right? Just like, uh, just like with security and availability, we think of scalability also as a shared responsibility model. And it's not enough that Amazon EKS just scales the control plane and the EKS and the Kubernetes components, but it's also necessary that you think of um, building a scalable, uh, building scalable um, architectures for your applications um, and follow some best practices that are required to make your cluster um, scale overall. Uh, but we do not want to leave it just there um, because customers uh, often look for guidance and, uh, and we consider it as our job to share best practices with, um, with them regarding how, how they can achieve these scalable architectures. So on that note, um, I put a link to a session uh, which is from one of my beloved colleagues um, in, the, um, in, in our account management team. He's a senior TAM named Shane Corbett, whom I've closely worked with for a lot of, putting out a lot of customer files around scalability, and uh, we've look at, looked at hundreds of customer issues together. So he summarizes um, that in his talk um, and explains how, how you should design against um, all those. All right, so... If you look at here, I mentioned customer workloads as both applications and add-ons. So I've talked about the applications part, but there's also this, uh, there's also this need to scale the add-ons. And we understand that our customers 
not always, um, they, they want to leverage uh, various add-ons that are available in the cloud native ecosystem, right? And not always do the add-on scale with uh, their requirements, and sometimes we run into issues. One big example is what I'm showing here in the slide is FluentBit. FluentBit is a, it's a logging um, solution for your containers. It implements log filters as well as persisting them across various backends. And a common problem that we run into, and we've seen customers uh, being plagued by this quite a bit, is both FluentD and FluentBit, if they're not configured properly, um, they might end up creating a spam of get and list uh, pod calls against your API, which is not ideal because that, um, that can overload your control plane as well as reduce the throughput of API calls that's available for other more critical um, system components, right? So what we did is at AWS, our um, container insights team, we, they worked closely with the open source FluentBit project and uh, they were able to optimize the API call usage pattern to not make these periodic list uh, pods calls to fetch pod metadata, but rather talk locally to the kubelet endpoint, uh, the, to the kubelet server endpoint to get that, get the uh, metadata about pods rather than querying the API server. So this architecture um, helped a bunch of our customers to actually scale to really large clusters while continuing to use um, FluentBit. Right, so this is just one example. Um, there are a lot of other um, add-ons that we have seen our customers uh, running into scalability issues with, and we actively, like our, all our on-calls and our software development team, we actively reach out to these third-party projects and uh, report issues and sometimes uh, suggest fixes to, to help solve this problem for our customers, especially with some of the most commonly used add-ons. Okay, so um, that, that was about the control plane. Let's talk a little bit about the cluster networking. As many of you know, networking is one of the tricky things to get right. It's challenging to scale your network um, with, um, to, to scale your network on different dimensions. So a quick recap on the Kubernetes networking model. So, the Q, so in Kubernetes, uh, it works out of this um, foundational aspect of networking that all your pods get their own IP addresses, and they're able to, uh, each pod is be able to talk to other pods from IP to IP, um, except when in cases where you block this through using some policies. Um, so this, this, this was adopted by the Kubernetes project because it greatly simplifies the it greatly simplifies your networking design, as well as it offers a low friction um, way to port applications that have been traditionally running on VMs to actually run on containers. Because with this approach, you don't have to worry about port conflicts and stuff like that, because uh, they, each port gets its own IP. So well, well this, this is a great model to begin with. One, issue which comes, one significant requirement of this is now you need a lot of IPs, right? If you, especially if you run a lot of nodes with a lot of pods, you, you need to have enough IPs and manage and maintain them um, in, in, along with your cluster. So that, that's not a straightforward problem. And some network administrators try to solve this problem by installing um, network plugins that virtualize your IP addresses a layer above the VPC. Um, that, that, while that helps you solve the problem of IP shortage, it typically also comes um, with, some, with certain limitations, such as it makes it hard to um, observe and troubleshoot your networking traffic, your applications. And if you're, if you're going to use this at scale, this, could tip, this typically also means you might see some effect to your network, networking performance. So, so yeah, essentially there are there's this problem, there's this whole pro set of problems around IP management, um, and on one extreme, while you need, um, so, so I like to see it as two problems on, on the extremes, right? If, if you try to um, reduce your IP wastage, IP space wastage, because there is a dearth of IPv4 addresses in general for folks using, um, folks trying to use IPv4 either with public addresses or private addresses, 
So on this end, there's this problem of managing your IP addresses effectively with less wastage. And on the other end, if you try to if you try to go overboard and optimize exactly for the number of IP addresses you need on the node, what can happen is your management of these IPs gets especially tricky, and uh, because now you'll need to make a lot of API calls to acquire these IPs, release them, and, and is issues such as those. Um, so this, this essentially, this, this becomes a challenging problem. So Amazon EKS has made some strides in this direction with two major improvements that help solve both these problems. So the first one is with, our, with the AWS VPC CNI, we are now able to offer increased pod density using EC2 networking innovations um, around uh, what we call as the, what is, uh, the prefix delegation feature. So, so, so what is this about? Essentially, previously with your nodes, you, need, you needed to acquire individual IP addresses for each pods and optionally release them when those pods are uh, uh, brought down now you can get a prefix, a CIDR block in your VPC the, for, the, for the network interface on the node instead of a single IP. So by default, we create like this slash 28 uh, prefix, which is 16 IPs. So you get 16 IPs instead of, uh, a single, uh, instead of the single IP you used to have before um, for your ENI. Um, this, this helps you in a bunch of ways because Previously, to get additional IPs, you needed to attach additional network interfaces to your nodes. Now you don't have to do that because you already get a lot of IPs uh, uh, with, with just a single network interface because of being able to attach multiple prefixes. Moreover, the other problem this also solves is this reduces the number of calls you make to EC2 APIs because instead of dealing with individual IPs, now you're dealing with prefixes. So, um, so that's something which has helped some of our large customers, um, such as Netflix, um, to, to, to help scale their networking architecture. So this feature is available starting from VPC CNI 1.9, um, just FYI. All right, so let's switch over now to the general problem with shortage of IPv4 addresses, right? So if you're using public IPv4 addresses, uh, you can, as you can see on the graph, there are hardly few left in the world. So at this point, grabbing hold of a public IPv4 address is as hard as finding a needle in a haystack. So if you're gonna, if, if, if you're gonna need a lot of public IPv4 addresses, um, you might soon run out of options with, with, with this graph, which shows how the available um, ciders, public ciders are, are diminishing. So, because of this problem, we have now uh, uh, we are now excited to launch uh, support for IPv6 on your Amazon EKS clusters. So this essentially allows your pods to get IPv6 addresses instead of IPv4 addresses. So this is not exactly the same as the Kubernetes dual stack support, um, where you get both the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, because that doesn't help you with the IPv4 exhaustion problem. So what we are announcing here is essentially dedicate um, uh, IPv6 only pods uh, that, that get uh, globally unique um, addresses. So as you probably know, there are like about um, 100 billion, billion, billion more IPv6 addresses than uh, IPv4 addresses, so you're practically unbounded with the number of IPs you can, you can get this way. So this also simplifies the, the way you architect your uh, networks because you no longer need to um, to do natting with private IP, which which you need to do if you're going to use a private IP address space and your pods need to talk to the internet. And this also offers much better uh, pod launch rates because since since you can just get an IPv6 um, address, uh, IPv6 CIDR um, for your node straight away. With enough addresses, you you don't need to um, you know you don't need to acquire and release IPs on the fly during as 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 you actually create your workloads. Um, so how does how does the architecture look uh, with IPv6 networking? It's uh, not very complex. Uh, let me explain 
what it is. So each square there is essentially one node. You have a node on the left side, you have a node on the right side. And what your CNI does is um, it, 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 the node itself, it gets a slash 80 uh, CIDR block from your VPC CIDR space. The VPC CIDR space itself can, can be up to a slash 56 block. Um, so slash 80 is a pretty big IP space, so you pretty much don't need to do um, any more IP management once you get that CIDR on that node. And each, each pod now gets uh, one IPv6 address from that space. Um, yeah, and your services uh, also get IPv6 address. So, um, um, but, uh, yeah, so they get an IPv6 address, but they're from um, a private IPv6 address space, which essentially um, makes managing your service cider as well pretty, pretty easy. Um, yeah, so if you're interested uh, in more about this, you can read up our um, EKS cluster communication um, section in our docs uh, once this lands. All right, so with, oops, I think I blacked it out. Yeah, so those, those are some of the innovations in the networking space which makes, which makes uh, the lives of our customers easier as they try to scale their clusters. With that, I'll hand it over to Alex to talk about scaling our worker compute. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So all of that uh, great work uh, would be for not, of course, if you're not able to have the compute that your cluster need, your cluster's workloads need um, to run at the scale that we're talking about. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about what that means and some of the features that we've launched uh, in the last couple of years that's helped support the kind of scale that we're talking about today. Um, but before we again, uh, and, and get really, really kind of deep into that. I, I want to talk a bit about the, the kinds of compute options that are available on Amazon EKS. Uh, th there's effectively three today, and, and you can think of these as sort of a spectrum of, of how much management and, and effort they may require. Uh, you obviously get some benefits around flexibility and, uh, and, and the degree of configurability uh, as you, you have to take on more of the responsibility for them. But, uh, the, this starts with self-managed EC2 instances. So these run in your account uh, like any normal EC2 instance and are, are fully managed uh, by you, the customer. Uh, these are, as a result, highly flexible and can be tailored to any kind of a use case that you may have that would be supported on an EC2 instance. Uh, one step further towards uh, a, a more managed compute experience is Amazon EKS managed node groups. Uh, these similarly run in your account but EKS takes on the responsibility of the provisioning and instance lifecycle management. So this means uh, we'll launch new instances as part of an, uh, an auto-scaling group, in fact, uh, when, when required, and then uh, provide easy, straightforward mechanisms to upgrade the, uh, the software on your nodes so that you can stay up to date. Uh, and then finally, all the way towards the, the far end of, of the, the sort of management spectrum is AWS Fargate. Uh, so you can run EKS uh, on AWS Fargate. This is a serverless option for, for EKS. Uh, the compute is entirely managed by AWS, and in fact, uh, doesn't even show up in your, the, the customer's account. Um, there's no ability to you know, SSH into a node or anything like that. Uh, the compute is right-sized for the workloads that are being launched, so you can specify the amount of vCPU and memory that your, your pod would require. And as a result, your build uh, on a pod basis. So by the amount of compute that you request for each pod, that's the, the kind of pay-as-you-go billing uh, that AWS uh, Fargate will provide with EKS. This, of course, you know, uh, has less options for, for con configuration, but really can be a very uh, hands-off approach to getting the compute that you need in your cluster. Now, with these options, I think that uh, uh, the one that we've really focused on the most in terms of supporting larger and larger EKS clusters is uh, Amazon, managed no Amazon EKS managed node groups. So I, I just want to take a second to uh, refresh everyone's memory of some of the features of Amazon uh, EKS managed node groups and, and talk a little bit uh, afterwards about some of the, the, the work that we've done that, that enables the kind of scale uh, we're talking about today. So um, just to remind everyone, EKS managed nodes in your cluster uh, and provide a lot, are, are based on a lot of the best practices that we've learned over, over the time that we've operated Amazon EKS. Uh, you can create, update, scale, and, and, and terminate the nodes for your cluster with a single command using the EKS console. EKS control 
uh, the AWS CLI, or infrastructure as code tools like Terraform and CloudFormation. Um, not only does Amazon EKS make it easy to launch compute uh, with EKS managed node groups, but it also orchestrates rolling upgrades and node draining before termination for nodes as they, uh, they're, they're upgraded, keeping applications highly available. Uh, we'll speak a little bit more uh, about some of the, uh, the features that have enabled uh, larger managed node groups uh, in, in a moment, specifically around, around upgrades. Finally, uh, nodes are, are terminated in a graceful manner. Uh, we cord and drain the node uh, before, before taking them out of commission to keep, keep applications healthy. Um, so with that, this kind of a, a sense of the, uh, the, the kinds of management that Amazon EKS provides through managed node groups, I want to talk about a couple of features we've launched uh, in the last few years that, that make it easy to support larger and larger EKS clusters. So first and foremost, and this, this came last year, is custom launch templates with Amazon EKS. You know, th this may not be obvious as to how, apart from the, the text on the slide, uh, may not be obvious how this helps support larger and larger clusters, but as Sean was mentioning, one of the things that's really critical is throughput to the API server uh, from the kubelet itself running on the node. Uh, with using, by using custom launch templates on, uh, in Amazon uh, managed, EKS managed node groups, you're able to tune the, uh, the, the QPS for the kubelet to unlock the kinds of scale that we've been talking about today. Um, I, I think that this is a, a really great option to uh, find that, that perfect balance between the amount of configurability and, and hands-off kind of management of nodes for, for ECAS clusters, giving you all kinds of options to, to send API or send configuration parameters to the kubelet uh, to, to tune it to the right kind of scale for your cluster. Now, uh, that, that helps you, you know, launch, new launch new nodes and have them be performant uh, as, as clusters grow. Uh, upgrades are a critical part of the, the cluster lifecycle, and, and, and nodes need to be kept up to date both for uh, security purposes as well as operational reasons. I think one of the, the, the most exciting features that, that helps unlock the, the, the scale that we're talking about today are, are parallel upgrades for managed node groups. So before this, you would have to upgrade nodes one at a time. We wanted to be very careful. Um, you know, operational excellence is one of our, our main tenants for Amazon EKS. And so we wanted to be very careful to not disrupt any of the applications on the cluster. But we heard from customers that some of their applications were more tolerant to, uh, to fault or, or unavailability, let's say partial unavailability. And so they wanted to be able to roll out these upgrades faster uh, when necessary. Th this also became really challenging for customers as their node groups grew. It would take you know, far longer than they would have liked to upgrade all the nodes in a, in a group. And so we released the feature uh, earlier this year to allow them to specify the amount of the, the, uh, the maximum unavailable nodes in a given managed node group. So this can be specified as a percent, a, a number of nodes. Uh, and so more fault tolerant applications are able to, uh, to benefit from the increased speed, uh, even as clusters grow larger and larger. Now, th there's, a, there's a final feature here that, that I'm really excited about, uh, and it's the most recent launch for EKS managed node groups. Um, I'm really excited about it personally because I, I think this is a great collaboration across AWS. So just this fall, I think a month ago or so, we launched native support for the Bottle Rocket operating system in managed node groups. Uh, if you're not familiar, Bottle Rocket is an open source operating system that's purpose built for running containers. Uh, many general purpose operating systems have software that, that the vast majority of containers will, will never need and contribute to additional overhead on the nodes that, that's gonna be unavailable for, for workloads uh, that, that you do really want to consume those resources. And so this kind of minimal security-focused operating system for containers is a great win for, for customers who really want to eke out as much performance uh, on, on their nodes as possible. The, the other benefit here, and this is, this is unrelated, if I'm honest, to, to the talk here today, but is that with this, this kind of more minimal approach to a container operating system comes security benefits by the reduced surface area of the variety of software that, that comes in the operating system itself. Uh, so, so very, very interesting for security conscious customers as well. Uh, so, what we released a month ago is, is first class support or native support um, for Amazon, for Bottle Rocket and Amazon EKS managed node groups. This means if you're in the console or the, the API or, or EKS control, um, you, can, you can choose uh, Bottle Rocket directly from, from a drop down or as an API parameter to launch your nodes with the Bottle Rocket operating system. Uh, all kinds of great things here, I think, with Bottle Rocket and, and certainly a, a a uh, feature that we're very proud of. So those are kind of the, uh, the features that we've launched and kind of the details around managed node groups that help enable the scale 
that, that we're talking about today. The problem is, is that compute is never static in a cluster. It tends to, to grow and, and shrink as, as the demand on the workloads in it uh, changes. And so a critical factor for uh, uh, unlocking uh, larger clusters is a, an auto scaler that can support these ki this kind of scale. And so I want to spend a little bit talking about Carpenter. Um, before I get into what Carpenter is, is a, a new open source project that, that we launched here at reInvent this year, I want to talk about what it isn't. Um, so if you're familiar with the Kubernetes uh, auto-scaling landscape, you can think of a, a handful of different kinds of uh, families of auto-scaling that, uh, that, that Kubernetes plays with. So first, there's pod auto-scaling, horizontal or vertical pod auto-scaling, changes either the number of replicas or the, the size of the resource requests of the pods in an application. This is very much not what Carpenter is meant to solve. I think that th there's a number of great solutions out there already, and, and Carpenter will work, work well with, with things like HPA and VPA. Um, however, at times, your, cl your cluster doesn't have the capacity that it needs as more pods are spun up or as the resource requests are increased, um, new workloads come online, et cetera, and so you need to add compute to your cluster. And so this is where products like the Kubernetes Cluster Autoscaler come in. They launch new nodes uh, in response to pending pods. And this is very much where Carpenter lives. The kind of problems that we were, we were hoping to solve with Carpenter are, are, are of this, this variety. Um, and so the reason I want to kind of talk about a few use cases and some of the challenges that we've heard from customers uh, around cluster autoscaling in Kubernetes, because I think that this has been really what motivated us to, to look at this problem space. So first and foremost, Nearly half of our customers uh, running Kubernetes on AWS were telling us that getting, getting cluster autoscaling right was hard, um, especially when they follow the best practices that we recommend for their clusters. For example, multi-AZ availability for, for high availability applications, uh, instance type flexibility, and, and leveraging spot to get these deep discounts uh, in their clusters. You can see here that this results in, in uh, uh, many, many different kinds of autoscaling groups and configurations that's required to, to do this effectively. And customers are telling us that getting this right could be tough. Um, this becomes tough in a couple of different use cases that, that I want to highlight here. First and foremost are a, a kind of classic Kubernetes use case, which is soft multi-tenancy. And I say soft here intentionally um, because you can think of this as, as you're like a, a, an apartment building with neighbors. They're friendly tenants, different teams in the same organization, or uh, perhaps even different applications within the same team. And they all have different computational requirements in their cluster. Uh, and so it was really challenging to get the configuration right for all of these different highly variable kinds of applications. And as a result, cluster efficiency and utilization suffered. So this is this one use case that we heard come up over and over from our customers that we thought we could, we could help them with. The, the other one are machine learning workloads. So um, the, these are, are very different from, from the previous kind of use case in that these are often um, job-based workloads, very uh, spiky. Uh, they need to quickly spin up a, a often quite a bit of, of expensive accelerated capacity to run experiments, train machine learning models, et cetera. And uh, the, the customers have told us that they, they've had challenges uh, getting, uh, getting the kind of capacity they need at the, at the speed that they need it, uh, which was really slowing down the pace of their innovation. And, and as it took time to you know, release that capacity back to us, uh, was, was costing them uh, more money than it needed to uh, while their jobs were, were had already been finished. And so with these use cases and challenges in mind, we, we set out to, to build Carpenter, which I can, I can happily announce today is, uh, is now generally available, v0.5. Um, Carpenter is an open source, flexible, and, and highly performant Kubernetes cluster autoscaler. Uh, while it's, it's similar in some ways to the, the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, it's different in other ways. I think one of the main differences here is that Carpenter will dynamically choose the best EC2 instance types or compute resource types uh, for the workloads that are coming into your cluster. It, like the cluster autoscaler though, will add and remove capacity from the cluster as needed. Uh, and then is, and I think this is a part of the, 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 the 0 0.5 release today, scale tested for the kind of high performance that we're, we've been talking about during this session, uh, and then is supported in when you, when you run Carpenter in EKS clusters. Um, I know this, this is probably pretty intriguing, but uh, short on the details, so I want to get right into how this actually works. Uh, Carpenter works in tandem with the Kubernetes scheduler itself and the cluster's compute provider. So in this case, you can imagine Amazon EC2. 
Uh, it looks for pending pods that are unable to be scheduled in a cluster due to the lack of compute capacity that could, could accept them. And so uh, when it sees that, that those pods are, are beginning to stack up, it launches new capacity in the cluster just to the right amount uh, that, that's needed to get those workloads to schedule, and similarly scales that, co that capacity back down uh, when, when those nodes become underutilized. And critically here, Carpenter works with the kinds of Kubernetes workload scheduling constraints that, that application developers use every day to get their applications into the right kind of shape that they want on their cluster. So think topology spread or, or well-known node labels, that kind of thing. Uh, Carpenter is built very uh, deeply and directly into, into Kubernetes, and I think that's a, a critical component here. Um, so with this, Carpenter brings a great deal of flexibility to how you can get the compute you need for your clusters. Uh, and, and I think that this is one of the key benefits here. So we'll easily run multiple different kinds of compute together. If your workload needs a GPU, Cluster will, or Carpenter will launch a GPU accelerated instance. If you need uh, Graviton, Carpenter will launch a Graviton instance. And this is all configurable using the same kind of Kubernetes CRDs that you use to specify your pods uh, to begin with. Uh, this is a, a, an example of a, the provisioner CRD that, that is Carpenter's main, main CRD. Uh, allows you to define a, a, a bit of policy. You can see a couple of examples here, TTL seconds after empty and until expired, et cetera, as well as configuration details that, that help Carpenter know how to speak to your cluster's API server as well as uh, compute provider. So by doing this, we're not only able to be much more flexible about the kind of compute that a, a cluster can leverage, but we're also able to be really fast. And this is where I think this uh, Carpenter is critical for auto scaling and especially large clusters. Uh, Carpenter is able to directly call EC2 uh, to get the compute that it needs. And today, although these, and I'll be very clear here, these are, these are goals for next year. Although today it's not quite at these, these figures, we do see t nodes and, and pods come up in about 45 seconds in the average case. This is, this is something that we're really excited about and I think will help customers get the compute they need just when they need it, and, and the right compute too. So no need to uh, over-provision or worry that there won't be enough capacity in your cluster to accommodate the workloads that it has. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that, and, and I think that this is, there's, there's gonna be all kinds of great performance improvements that we can expect. Uh, from Carpenter next year. We're, we're, we're taking a very serious goal to, uh, to continue to drive those launch times down. Um, I'll, I'll leave this up here. This, this is a little bit of kind of a sneak peek into where we see Carpenter going in the future and, and a bit of detail about the release that we've launched today. Um, I, I'd encourage everyone to go to the, to the GitHub page. Uh, a bunch of, of great, great stuff there. Uh, we have a, a full docs page as well that, that you'll find a link to from the repository. I think I also want to emphasize that Carpenter is an open source project, Apache 2 licensed, and designed to work across wherever your cluster may be running. Today, there's an AWS cloud provider, so it uses a, a kind of cloud provider architecture, uh, but we really would, would encourage anyone to, to uh, submit pull requests to help improve the project or provide uh, its capabilities to other environments. Next year, we, we have some exciting stuff on the roadmap. I think first and foremost, the, 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 where Carpenter is today is just the beginning. I think that scheduling and, and launching compute very quickly is, is already a, a great feat for the project. However, next year, we're gonna have, have help customers to optimize the, the compute in their cluster. So think, uh, you can imagine a, a scenario where Carpenter sees just a couple of pods coming in every so often, launches a handful of small nodes, your cluster suddenly has many, many small nodes, which is, is inefficient due to a variety of kind of Kubernetes specific, let's say, taxes, uh, daemon set and, and the cube system tax specifically. And so Carpenter will look for opportunities to improve the, uh, the efficiency of the cluster by rescheduling pods onto more efficient compute. This is, to be clear, still something that we're working on diligently, but, but definitely an important com consideration, I think, for the project in the future. So you could set Carpenter up get the compute you need very quickly, and then know that over time, Carpenter will help you uh, make your cluster more efficient. Similarly, you know, this, is, this is critical for the machine learning workload that, that I was describing earlier, which often come with a variety of, of data that needs to be located pretty, quick, pretty closely to the node, um, is volume-aware scheduling. So Carpenter will spin up compute in the right AZ so that uh, if there's an EBS volume with the kinds of data that's required to, to train those machine learning models, It'll be available uh, right there next to the machine uh, and enable, enable uh, that kind of uh, 
quick, quick uh, data transfer that, that would be required. Similarly, you may be familiar with, with Amazon EKS Anywhere, uh, which went GA earlier this year. Uh, we think this is an interesting opportunity for, for Carpenter as well. And, and similarly, Carpenter, you know, and I think that I maybe uh, kind of glossed over this a bit, because Carpenter asks for a, a very diverse set of compute, if, you're, if your workload is, is amenable to it, um, it's a really great fit for Spot. Um, if, the more flexible that you can be in your spot request, the more likely you are to get, and, and more importantly, keep the capacity, the spot capacity that, that you, uh, you're asking for. And so by asking for the, most, the biggest variety of compute, uh, this is a, a really great opportunity uh, to get the kind of deep discounts that, that are available via uh, EC2 spot. And so what we plan on doing is to integrate with the spot interruption handler. This will allow you to, uh, to, for your cluster to automatically recover as spot instances are reclaimed. Uh, and so I think this would just make spot on, on Amazon EKS that much, that much easier to use, which would, would I think make a lot of customers really happy. So with that, I think you know, we're, we're kind of coming to an end here. And I'd like to highlight a, a couple of things and, and point you to a few websites uh, that I think are really critical for us, the, the, uh, the Amazon EKS team, uh, and, and hopefully would, would be useful for, for, uh, for you all, our customers. Um, first and foremost is the Amazon EKS Best Practices Guide. Um, this is an open source best practices guide, kind of broken down into different themes, uh, security, scalability, uh, et cetera. And uh, I think a really great resource for anyone wanting to go kind of to the next level about how to think about their clusters, how to architect them for performance and scale, and then uh, keep an eye on it because we always add new, new, new sections and really kind of is the, the distillation of, of the, the thinking of the team and, and all the, the, the folks here at, at AWS who think about Kubernetes day in and day out. Um, I, I'm biased because I'm a product manager, but I want to hear your feature requests. Uh, this is a, a QR code that will take you to the, uh, the containers roadmap on GitHub. We review this frequently and uh, it, it oftentimes have, have great conversations with our customers in the comments of issues around feature requests. Uh, I think this is for all of the container services, so uh, you know, ECR, ECS, EKS. Uh, happy to hear your feedback for any of them and, and where, uh, where we could be uh, adding new exciting features. You, you'll also be able to keep up uh, with uh, the kind of the timeline as we start to work on new features. I think this is a great place to, uh, to sort of really be uh, on the pulse of, of, of our container services. Uh, we, and I, I, I'm going to emphasize this again. We check this all the time. It's great, a great resource for us, and I, I would be thrilled to see even one person from this audience uh, open an issue. So with that, I want to highlight a couple of related sessions here at reInvent 2021. Uh, so first and foremost uh, is the, uh, some of these have happened already. You want to check them out uh, online or on, on uh, the, the sort of recordings. Kubernetes AWS, the overall strategy and roadmap session uh, that I think happened earlier today or yesterday. Uh, similarly, this, this high performance uh, session will be probably of interest to folks who are uh, in this, this room. And, and GitOps, I think, is also an area where we're starting to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest from our customers in terms of managing their clusters using a GitOps methodology. There's, there's also a deep dive on EKS and then uh, best practices for uh, mitigating events in Kubernetes clusters. So you know, with that, I think we're going to wrap up here and just want to thank you one last time uh, for your time today. Really excited to, to be here and, and to speak to all of you about some of the, the work that we've been doing at Amazon EKS. Thank you.